Good morning. Let's stand and turn to song 245. <laughs> Number 245 to get us going. We'll sing the battle hymn of the Republic. First, second, and last on 245. Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we, uh, as Gary said, we have a lot to owe, or a lot that is owed to men and women that have sacrificed for us. And we certainly do appreciate them and lift them up uh, to the Lord. Let's 
Let's go to 58 for our next song here, and then we'll take our offering up. But 58, we'll sing When I See the Blood, first, second, and the last. 58. And while they're coming up, I'll remind you, we have a missionary coming this Wednesday. Uh, and uh, he is headed to somewhere in Africa and looking forward to that. So uh, Wednesday night, come out and see this missionary. And then got another one coming uh, about a month from now, a little bit less than a month. Looking forward to that. And then one more announcement, and I'll mention a few more times. But we've got a vacation Bible school. Uh, I believe it's the last part of the last full week of June. So about a month away there. As well, so be much in prayer for for our vacation Bible school, and again the missionary coming here Wednesday night. Johnny, would you lead us in a word? Lord, we give you all the honor, glory, and praise that you deserve. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this time you've given us to come to your house and listen to your holy word, your living word, to learn about you, to worship you, to praise you, to have fellowship with you, and fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we thank you for your love, your grace, your forgiveness, and your mercy, your goodness, your kindness, your long suffering. We thank you for our salvation through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings you give us each and every day. May we never take any blessings for granted nor forget that everything we receive you comes through Jesus Christ and what he did for us upon the cross. We thank you, Lord, for loving us so much that you sacrificed your only son. You sent us blameless, perfect son to die for us upon the cross, even though we are still sinners. And we thank you, Jesus, for loving us so much that you freely gave yourself to be that perfect sacrifice, taking our sins, our judgment, our punishment upon yourself, Shedding your blood and dying upon that cross for us. Freeing us from the bondage of sin and saving us from eternal damnation. We thank you. Lord, we pray for our missionaries, wherever they are and wherever they're going. We ask that you bless them and protect them. They be successful in the work they're doing for you. We ask that you continue out of this church to support them so we all may have a part in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for the ones on our prayer list, spoken and unspoken. Lord, we pray for all the weak to help us to hope. We lift them up to you, Lord, and we meet them every day. We pray for the unsaved, the lost. We pray that your love, mercy, and grace that you bestow on them each day will not be in vain. That they will come to know and accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. Lord. After we leave here today, Lord, may we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and direct us in our daily walk as a Christian. And may we remember that we are the children of God 
followers of Jesus Christ, joint heirs to the kingdom of heaven, may we live our lives in a manner that reflects the Holy Spirit that lives and dwells within us. Now we ask forgiveness of our sins and deliverance from these In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. <laughs> Seven for our next song. Number 97, we'll sing I Am Bound for the Promised Land. We'll do uh, the first, second, last on this one, 97. We had best stand on this one. Let's go to 244 as we stand. 244 and we will sing America. Let's sing the first, second, and last 244. Thank you. 
بیشتر بود Go to Romans chapter 8 to start us off here this morning. Romans and chapter 8. And we will look at a familiar uh, verse here that we uh, seem to go to pretty often as we study the Bible. And for various reasons, we'll, we'll kind of look at this verse and almost kind of cling to it sometimes in at moments in our life. In Romans and chapter 8, Listen here as we look at verse 28. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called or are called according to His purpose. Let's say you go to a, a pharmacy store or something and you go and you get a prescription filled. Pharmacists might take a few different uh, compounds and, and containers and so on and uh, off the shelf or whatever, and they, uh, they're going to mix them together and they're going to make your medicine. Some of those things they grab off the shelf by themselves are quite dangerous uh, and they'll hurt you, uh, if not even worse uh, than, than that. And yet when they are mixed together in the proper amounts in the proper way, they can heal your body. That's how our God works too. Our God works by taking all of our problems, all the situations of life, that we go through that some of which look terrible and some of which are dangerous uh, and can lead to uh, some very painful things emotionally, physically, whatever it might be and yet he mixes them all together and he produces something that is so helpful for our spiritual uh, body, our spiritual health and that is that medicine for the soul. All these different things that, that happen to us, that, that we partake in, whatever it might be, all things work together for good that love God. Romans 8.28 has a, a, a great promise for those that love God. In Romans 8.28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. We see Paul is reminding these Roman Christians here about the kind of chemistry workings of God in their lives. And this process allows God to Take those circumstances of life, the good, the bad, the bitter, the sweet, and blends them together into something that's wonderful for you and I. He can take all of our, our life and turn it into a situation that works for our good and, more importantly, for His 
glory. And so we'll look here this morning at some of the, the blessings that's contained within this, this pretty short verse here uh, in verse 28. This promise of God that we can cling to and we'll think about how God works. How He kind of uh, is a, a chemist in working to make all these things work together for our good. And as we go through this, we should start to assure ourselves that God can take our life with all its ups and downs. He can blend with it His grace. He adds to it His love transforming it into something that's beauty and that's a blessing to us. So the first thing we have to realize about this promise, we have to understand the certainty of this promise that we have, uh, that, that Paul writes to us here. He says, and we know, doesn't he? Right there at the start. We know that all things work for our good. There are no questions there are no qualifications of what Paul says here. We know. No caveat, nothing like that. It's an ironclad promise from the Almighty God Himself. Turn back maybe a couple pages or so to chapter 4 of Romans. And notice here what Paul writes in verse 21. He reminds us uh, here of something extremely important. In verse 21 of chapter 4, it says, And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. God's reputation depends on his word and him keeping his word. God always keeps his word. We can go and think back to the early part of, of the Bible that we have in Genesis and going forward a little bit. We can think about Genesis in chapter 3. After the fall of man, what does God do? He promises a Messiah. We, we, we know how that turned out. Then we can think about Genesis in chapter 12. He takes Abraham, uh, a man of faith, and he promises to make a great nation out of Abraham. And of course we know how that works out. We can think about in Exodus 3 where he goes to Moses and he promised to free the nation of Israel, Abraham's nation, uh, out of, uh, free him out of that bondage of, of Egypt. What's he do? He does just that. We can all then go to or think about Joshua chapter 1. Uh, there they are. They, they've gone through their wilderness wanderings for 40 years. And uh, Joshua takes the reins of the nation and God promises to lead them into that promised land and conquer the inhabitants thereof. God keeps His promises. God cannot break His promises. Saw this from a, a Baptist preacher in, in the 1800s in England. His name was F.B. Meyer. He said, If any promise of God should fail, the heavens would clothe themselves in sackcloth, the sun, the moon, the stars would reel from their courses, the universe would rock, and a hollow wind would moan through a ruined creation the awful fact that God can lie. We would have nothing if God could tell a lie. If he could break a promise, go to go to Hebrews chapter six. That's a, a kind of a terrifying thought if you allow yourself to think that way that God could go back on His word. But we need never fear. Notice what Hebrews chapter six. Look at verse eighteen. Tells us here, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter six and verse eighteen that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie we might have a strong consolation who had fled for refuge to lay a hold upon the hope set before us. Go back a little bit to Titus and chapter 1. Titus and chapter 1, right after First and Second Timothy there. Titus and chapter 1. Notice here in verse 2, as Paul writes, in hope of eternal life, which God, and Paul says, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Our God cannot lie. And so when He tells us in Romans 8.28, we know all things work together for good to them that love God, we can take it with certainty. 100% uh, that, that we can, can have faith that God uh, is telling us the truth, that He this is a fact, a truth for you and I. So we understand the certainty when God says something, when He promises something. We can also look at uh, the, uh, the fullness or the, the completeness of what God's promise is here in Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28 doesn't say that most or that some things work together. He says all things work together 
for good to them that love God. All, of course, is everything. Every member or individual part of something, all things work together. There are no accidents in our world or in our life. God works all things for a purpose. Everything in the life of the child of God is working for your good. Even things we don't fully understand, even things we don't really like, these things are working for our good. Think about some areas in our life, some, some situations, some circumstances, some things that happen to us in our life. Think about some of these things. We can think about the sweet things that, that happen to us in our life. It's easy to think about the, the sweet things that uh, in our life that, that work for our good, that, kinda, uh, that, that work for us. We think about our home and our family and our health and our wealth and our salvation. All these things, that's easy for us to think about and understand. Yes, that's, that's working for our good. Those are the things of life that, that make our life feel good, that make our life that we might even say worth living. And I don't really want to say it like that, but, uh, but, but these are the things that make life easy. Uh, for us to, to live and endure and so on and so forth. Uh, the blessings of the... Well, actually, go to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, sorry. These blessings from the Lord, these good things, these sweet things of life, they should cause us to want to be better Christians. And notice here what Paul says in Romans chapter 2 and look at verse uh, 2, 3, and 4. Romans in chapter 2, verse 2. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. In verse 4, Or despisest thou the riches of His goodness, and forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. The good things of God lead us to God. Whether we're out of His will and we must repent and get back in His will, or we're in His will and we just keep staying there. It's easy for us to kind of see that uh, when, when things are going good or when something good happens uh, for us, uh, we, uh, we, we kind of see God working. But uh, as a, a little bit of a, a, a warning or something like that, we look at or actually just listen to Hebrews in chapter 13 and in verse 15. Uh, yeah, thirteen fifteen says, By Him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. <clears throat> so while it's easy for us to realize these good things of God, these sweet things of God are, are beneficial to our life, we must not forget to thank Him for those good things that happen uh, or that come to us uh, in, our, in our life. So the sweet things of life work for our good but also the bitter things of life work for our good. There's a lot of examples in the Word of God where some extremely bitter and sorrowful things happen to people, and yet it worked for good in the end. Go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. We can think about David. And a few weeks ago we spent some time on David. But uh, David suffered many afflictions in his life. Some of them self-afflicted. And some of them were, were things that God was letting him go through to, to make him stronger and so on. And David, uh, the highlights of his afflictions in life, we could think about him being uh, chased by Saul and ran out of his country and away from all his family and so on. And uh, Saul wanted his head. And we could think about him losing his son uh, with Bathsheba and so on as a result, a consequence of his sin. But in the end, notice what he says in Psalm 119 and verse 71. David writes, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might lean, or excuse me, yeah, uh, learn thy statutes. In the end, David understood that these afflictions that he faced were working for good. Go back to Genesis in chapter 50, and I think it would be a requirement for us to go to Genesis in chapter 50. And look at this verse, if we're talking about all things working for good uh, to them that love God. We know about Joseph. We know how Joseph was sold into slavery by his own brothers. We know that Joseph was thrown in the jail for years and years and uh, kind of had a, a few ups and then he would get come crashing back down and he did that for years and years. And yet, 
uh, in the end, he becomes the number two man in the uh, in the uh, 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 or of the strongest nation, uh, worldly nation at the time. And he says in verse twenty of Genesis chapter fifty, "But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive." Again, Joseph went forward, and yet. There was purpose in those bitter things of his life. One more that we'll look at, and this one's a little more obscure, but go to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles, and look at uh, chapter 33 of 2 Chronicles. Here we have a, a king that takes the reins of the, uh, or takes the throne of, of Jerusalem at a young age called Manasseh. And we see him a little bit uh, here in the Bible, but. Uh, notice here in verse 1 and 2 to kind of get the picture of how Manasseh came uh, to the throne. In 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 33, verse 1, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. But notice verse 2, but did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord like unto the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord has cast out before the children of Israel. Manasseh takes the throne at the age of 12 and didn't do very good with the throne. Did evil in the sight of the Lord. But then notice verse 11 on down a few verses of the same chapter. Verse 11 says, Wherefore the Lord brought them or upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him and he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. And notice, then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Manasseh gets ca uh, uh, captured. King of Jerusalem gets captured, uh, but he wasn't doing very good in his life. And then he sees the light. Then he understands God working in his life and he turns his life around. Oftentimes in our life, maybe the sick bed or the valley of suffering or the times of sorrow, those kind of teach the best sermons, don't they, in our life. We start to see uh, what's going on. Uh, we see the truth about what's going on in our life. And when God allows these times of sorrow or the suffering or the pain in our life, it's always for the good in our life. It's always for His glory uh, towards Him. Remember, God never said that we were going to like it. God never said we were going to enjoy uh, a perfect life after salvation, but even when these bitter things might come to us in life, we still need to be thankful. Why? Because He's working them for good in our life. That's not easy. That's hard. Uh, as, as we uh, go through those valleys and we, we go through some sufferings and pain and so on, that's a hard thing uh, to, 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 stay, to, to uh, take hold of or stay, uh, keep a grasp of uh, in this. But I saw a quote that says, it's the eye that is washed with tears that sees the best. How true that is sometimes in our life. When we get to the point of, of crying, of weeping, we start to get a little clarity sometimes in our life because we start to rely on our God and knowing, yes, even these bitter things can turn for good. So sweet and bitter things work for our good. We can also look at uh, an example of when evil things also work for our good. Notice 2 Corinthians. Let's go to 2 Corinthians and uh, chapter 12. Evil things, we'll, we'll say uh, for, for our purposes right here, uh, these are things that, that we don't bring upon ourselves necessarily. It's just the devil working in our life. And yet, we when we see the devil working or uh, causing us harm and pain, we can still realize that these things work for our good. 2 Corinthians in chapter 12, and you know where we're kind of headed here, Paul and that thorn in his flesh. Notice what Paul says in verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. In verse 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, 
in reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am, or then am I strong. Paul endured a satanic attack, an evil attack, an affliction uh, throughout his life with this thorn in the flesh, whatever that might be. Something that certainly caused him pain, whether it's spiritually, physically, or both, whatever it might be. Uh, he endured these satanic attacks, but God can use even the devil to work out good things in our life. Another easy example of this is our Lord Savior Jesus Christ. Despised and rejected by His own people, beaten and nailed to the cross, and yet all of those sufferings that He goes through result in our opportunity to have salvation. I think about what happened to these two missionaries in Haiti. Uh, and uh, I don't know why that would happen. I don't know why uh, uh, missionaries for uh, the Lord God would be killed and so on. I don't know what purpose that serves, but I do know God works all things for good to them that love Him. Even these satanic attacks are used by the Lord to grow us up in uh, in His image, to be uh, become closer to uh, Him and so on. And we'll talk more about that here in just a bit. Bitter or sweet things, bitter things, evil things. Also, we can think about, and we'll move on after this, but the sinful things uh, in our life that work for our good. Of course, all Christians should strive to never sin. Because when we sin, we know we're going to suffer. That is a, that is a fact, that we, that's a truth that we uh, have to understand. When we sin, we are going to suffer. But God can take the sufferings that come as, as a result of sin uh, and He can use it for our good. Let's go to Luke chapter 22. We looked at this, or a similar, or close passage here, but we looked at the at kind of the, the story here um, a little bit last week. But go into Luke in chapter 22. And we can look at Peter and how he denied Christ. A deliberate sin from Peter. And notice here in verse 31 on down a little bit in Luke in chapter 22. It says in 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that you may sift, or he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and that and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. We know Peter, and we, again, we looked at this a little bit last week. Uh, but Peter, of course, you know, denied Christ, just as Christ uh, said. But yet, we think about where Peter went from there. Peter just kind of, uh, he, he kind of revamped himself. He picked himself up, up uh, from failing uh, those three times, and he becomes one of the greatest apostles that we have and wrote some tremendous uh, letters that we have here in the inspired Word of God. God can use all circumstances of our life for good. The sweet, the bitter, the evil, the sinful. He can use all circumstances in our life for good. We may not see it in the moment. In fact, oftentimes we don't uh, see it in the moment. But we can still take comfort and we can rejoice in the completeness of God's promises. So, uh, we understand. God promises something, it happens. We understand how complete and how... Uh, how, how well-rounded uh, God is able to take these things that happen in our life and fulfill these promises, we might ask the question, how? How is God able to do these things? How is He able to keep His promises? And of course, the short answer is, He is all-powerful and all-knowing. He is our Almighty God. Uh, he's able to take control of every situation in our life. It's easy sometimes to forget that God is in control. Uh, I have it marked, Job 42, verse 2. Job says, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Go to Matthew in chapter 28. Matthew in chapter 28. We see a New Testament version here uh, of, uh, and, a, and a promise uh, from Jesus uh, that our God is always in control and He is all-powerful and all-knowing. Matthew 28, 18, of course you know, we're right here at the, at the Great Commission. And he said, it says in 18, Jesus came and spake unto them, All power is given me unto me in heaven and in earth. How uh, can God work all things for good? Because He controls all things. He knows all things. Uh, it's, it, would be, uh, it would be hard for Him not to be able to, to work all things for 
uh, for our good. Uh, go to Matthew chapter 14. The key here, though, if we understand this truth of God all-powerful and all-knowing and being able to, uh, and that's why He is able to uh, fulfill His promise for us. The key for us, though, is to, is to uh, keep our eye on Him. Uh, and we see an example here, a quick example, but we'll look at Peter again. Uh, as uh, the storm comes and Jesus, of course, is walking on the water here in, in Matthew chapter 14. Notice here verse 28. It says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sing, to cry, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Peter had his eye on Jesus, and as soon as he got his eye off Jesus, he starts to sink. Of course, Jesus picks him up uh, in this. We can never doubt that God can keep his promises. We can't doubt that God is all-powerful and all-knowing and is able to keep His promises. But when life closes in on us, we have to remember, if we belong to Jesus, then God is behind every circumstance that we might face in our life. So, that's how God is able to keep His promises. We have to trust in that. We have to believe in that, that He is able to keep His promises. But we also have to go back, if you will, to Romans chapter 28. And we have to note something here uh, uh, before we, we kind of get to the last kind of point here. We have to note that God's promise is conditional. And sometimes we don't like to think of it that way, uh, but, but in truth, uh, God's promise uh, for all things working to, uh, for good in our lives is conditional. I'm not talking about anything salvation-wise. Uh, I'm just talking about uh, living our life and trying to live it uh, as, 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 uh, as good as we can for our God. Notice what he says in 28. And we know all things work together for good to them that love God. And there is the condition. There is the condition of his promise. It is not for everyone, this promise to work all things for good. It's for only those that love God. If all things work together for good that love God, then the opposite also must be true. It, the opposite must be true for those that don't love God. You ever get out of God's will and you think, why is it just continually something bad is happening to me? When we get our eyes off of our God, when we aren't uh, diving deep into the Word of God and in prayer and so on, uh, we find that the opposite of good things working together happens. These bad things start to work against us, and it seems like it's a constant thing. And then, we, of course, uh, we won't go into it, but we can apply that certainly to the, un, uh, the unsafe, the lost of, of the world, and that's an easy one uh, for us to see. But we think about if we went to the doctor, and we didn't trust that doctor, so we wouldn't follow his prescription, his treatment, and as a result, we wouldn't experience the blessing of healing. Well, the same is true for us if we do not love and trust our God. We have to love Him, we have to trust His wisdom, or we're going to rebel against Him and we're going to refuse to submit to His will for our life. So how can we tell if we really love God? Number one, are we saved? 1 John 4.19 says, If you love me, or excuse me, it says, uh, We love Him because He first loved us. Uh, we think about Jesus taking that first step, and we talked about this Wednesday night, that first step in love towards us. By grace, He came down here, uh, took the form of man. Uh, he stepped towards us, but if we, uh, so, so if we understand that concept, then it starts to, uh, start to kind of get uh, built up within us, and we understand, yeah, God loved us, and I need to love Him back. I need to rely on Him for that salvation. We have to love God to the point of, Salvation, trusting him, trusting for, uh, in him for uh, our eternal life. Are we saved? Number one, number two. If we're saved, are we being obedient to God? How do we know if we love God? Are we obeying God? Go to John chapter fourteen. Puts it pretty plainly here for us. And John chapter fourteen, a couple of different verses, in fact, that we have from Jesus, uh, with instructions on obedience equaling the love, or love equaling obedience, I should say. 
Notice here in verse 15 of John chapter 14, John, uh, Jesus says, If ye love me, keep my commandments. Verse 21 of the same chapter, Jesus says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself in him. Our love for God is first proven by our salvation, then it's proven by our obedience to him. If you love me, keep my commandments. Obey me, Jesus says. We have no right to claim the promises of Romans 8.28 unless we qualify as one who loves him. So when we deal with Jesus, go to John chapter 10. When we deal with Jesus, the result when dealing with Jesus can be either good or bad for us. Notice what Jesus tells us here in verse 9. He tells us, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is the door. To be saved, or excuse me, to the saved, he is the door into the glories of heaven and to that eternal life. But to the lost, who refuse to enter into that door, they head into a life of damnation and eternal hell, of separation in that hell. It's vitally important for us to love God. Because if we love God, this great promise can be ours now and forever. To love God means to be saved and to be obedient to Him. So, we think about uh, these promises of God. We think about uh, the uh, certainty, the completeness. We think about how God is able to keep His promises because He is all-knowing and all-powerful. We think about the caveat, the condition of that promise is for us to love Him. But if we get in that, uh, if we get, uh, if, if we uh, show that love, and if we exude uh, what God wants us to uh, show and, 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 uh, and take part in His will and so on, we can look at the results of, God promise, of God's promise and getting what uh, He wants from us. Go back to Romans in chapter uh, 8 and maybe I'll make some sense out of it. Romans in chapter 8. Notice here again, verse 28, one more time, and then we'll look at the next couple of verses. Verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are uh, the called according to His purpose. It's not a verse that we have here designed for our happiness. I'll say that again. This verse is not designed for our happiness. Not that we can't get happiness out of it. But it's not designed for our happiness. It's not something to be taken lightly. Notice verses 29 and 30. And 29, For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, we talked about that earlier, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, them He also called. And whom He called, them He also justified. And whom He justified, them He also glorified. We are called to be like Jesus. God's purpose in turning everything to good is not to bless us, even though we see those blessings in, the, in, uh, in that purpose. But it's not to bless us. It's not to make us happy. It's not to make us wealthy. God is doing all that He does so that we will be more like Jesus, so that we will emulate Him, so that the world can see a little bit of light in the darkness. God didn't finish with you at salvation. In fact, He just started with you at salvation. And He'll continue to shape you until you reflect the image of His Son perfectly. Now that ends up in heaven, uh, of course, eventually. But we strive to be like our Lord and Savior every single day. The whole purpose of Romans 8.28 is to teach us that God has an eternal plan and that nothing will ever be able to change that plan. All things work together for good that love God. God is busy replicating Himself in us every single day. He's striving to get us to see our purpose. He predestinated our purpose. He's striving to get us to see uh, that. So as we close up, God always saves the best for last. The truth is, this great promise, uh, the truth of this great promise is that one day when all our plans, our hopes, our dreams are gone, we're going to be like Him. We're going to spend an eternity in, in a perfect place uh, uh, in heaven uh, being like Him. 
I'm not saying we are Him, but we are like Him. We can think of God as being a, a, a kind of a, a master diamond cutter. You think about the things that happen in our life and uh, all these things that we endure and we enjoy in life and uh, one day after God has chipped and chisels, chisels, chisels us away, away at us, we're going to be this perfect diamond. This is God at work on us. God is working again. It's the, it's the bitter, it's the sweet, uh, it's the evil, it's the sinful. All of these things work together uh, for our good. And that, that alone makes every situation we face worthwhile, doesn't it? If we can just see God working, or understand even, God working is working in our life, even through those things we don't want to go through, then it makes those situations worthwhile in our life. As God works out His chemistry in our lives, we can be assured that we'll be the ones who are ultimately going to benefit. We need to bring all our circumstances before Him and trust in His all-powerful and all uh, his all, all powerful to do things in His will. Trust in His wisdom in His life that He is working all things for good to them that love Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to You this morning. God, I'm praying we did You justice here this morning. God, I'm praying, Lord, that just a few of these words may be sunk in and that we won't lose these words as we head out here in just a few minutes, God. Lord, I continue to lift this church up to You, Lord. We just pray for Emmanuel Baptist Church and all... Uh, all the things going on with us, Lord. And we just pray for continued strength and uh, for, for guidance and wisdom, Lord, that You'll just lead and that Your will will be done in all these things, God. We pray for, uh, for the uh, missionary coming here in a few days, God, looking forward to that and just praying that's a blessing to each and every one of us and glorifying uh, to You in that. And I pray we'll come out and support uh, this missionary. God, just be with us, Lord. Praying so much for your just uh, your will to be done here. God, praying one more time that if there's anyone here this morning that knows you not as their Savior, that hasn't taken that step of love towards you, that Lord, today would be the day they step forward, came to this old-fashioned altar when we start singing this song of invitation and just accept that uh, eternal gift of salvation. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Turn to 375. Number 375.